Eve, good afternoon live from Geneva. A very special time, a very special festival. We're live from the um, Pitoef Theatre, right in the center of uh, Geneva. It's a huge theatre, it's a very nice theatre. It should have been filled with people. Unfortunately, there are very few people today, and you know the reason why. Nevertheless, the festival is on, the festival is live for a few um, days here in Geneva. Welcome to the FIFDH, welcome to the International Film Festival and Forum on Human Rights. And human Human rights is very, very crucial. We're going to talk this afternoon about a very, very crucial issue on detention and the privatization. Just about everywhere in the world, the privatization of detention centers, privatizations of prisons. And you're going to learn a lot, a lot about what is going on privately behind the prison cells. I will introduce very briefly our panel and we'll show you a little clip, a little film. We're very lucky here. The, 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 the organizers and I wish to thank them a lot for organizing such a, pa pa a panel. My name is Luc. I'm a French uh, investigative journalist. I also produce documentaries, so I'm coming from Paris. But here we have today with us Femke von Welten. You have produced and co-directed a film that should have been uh, uh, presented today that was filmed in South Africa. We're going to see a trailer in just a couple of, of, uh, of minutes. In your film, you have an amazing uh, investigative journalist, uh, Ruth Hopkins, who lives in South Africa. So you're from the Netherlands. You live in South Africa, Ruth, and, uh, and also in England. You're an investigative journalist, and we're going to talk about your work that has been um, uh, mainly uh, uh, portrayed and shown in uh, in uh, in the film that should have been presented uh, in this theater today. Uh, we have with us. We're very lucky to have uh, Agnès Calamar. You're French, and uh, you're the special rapporteur at the United Nations, and you're uh, uh, really working on on a very important topic that uh, we'll be discussing uh, this afternoon on the extrajudicial summary arbitrary executions. We're not going to talk about executions, but we're definitely going to talk about arbitrary. Tension uh, conditions. Uh, Abdulaziz, thank you so much for being here today. Abdulaziz Muhammad, you are originally from Sudan, and you will tell. We've just had lunch, to be quite precise. We've just had lunch, and uh, and uh, and everyone was really, really um, uh, impressed by your testimony. Um, Abdulaziz has been detained for five years in a small island, not very far from Australia, and you've probably heard about the uh, very bad um, conditions on Manus Island. And uh, what we will learn with your testimony is that all these uh, operations, and you've been detained there for five years, it was extremely long, um, and uh, uh, under very harsh conditions. And again, this uh, prison was uh, run by a private company. And finally, we have Michael Flynn. Uh, you're based in the US, I believe. No, in Geneva. You're based in Geneva, but you're American, and you're the director of the Global detention project. Now on to the trailer. Uh, we would have loved to see this room again full of uh, full of um, people and attendees. Um, the good thing is that you're going to be able to react and uh, send us your uh, questions and uh, react to uh, what you will hear from our panelists. Please um, take a look at the um, uh, trailer of, um, of the film that uh, we should have uh, seen today. It's called Prison for Profit. <laughs> It is quite frightening to wake up knowing what is it that you're going to face. Should anything happen, obviously you are dead. But it, it's a job. Mangahung Maximum Security Prison, the first ever privately run public prison in the country. The prison is run by the international security company G4S. It's a huge company and it's profit driven. I started speaking to inmates. He has these scars here. We're kind of the only journalists they can turn to. We're dealing with high-risk inmates, gangsterism. Anything can happen at any time. Video footage shot inside the prison was leaked. And then I started talking to warders. I think probably up to like 70, 80 inmates that I've interviewed who said they've been electroshocked. Somehow, I, 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 I think I was part of that. They were taught how to solicit information through torture. 
they violated our right. rights. Whenever services get privatised, costs go up. An inmate is kind of a commercial entity. We were beginning to see that we are used here. Things must change. You'll end up doing extreme things. I'm not an enemy. No, no. Will God ever forgive me for doing this? Remember, hatred is something that you are not born with. You are taught to hate. The revenue of the prison is over $630 million. It's in their interest to have crime has got up. There's this phrase that they use. They say, adapt or die. It's all about money. It's all about profit. Prison for Profit, co-directed by Is Ilse van Velsen and Femke. You're here with us <laughs> from Velsen. It's uh, produced by IF Production. It's a uh, production company based in the Netherlands. The entire documentary was filmed in um, South Africa uh, on Mangog um, Prison. Um, would you have seen a very powerful trailer? Um, before we come to your film, um, uh, you probably seen a logo in this film. The logo is G4S. It's the company, uh, the private um, company. It's a multinational company uh, based in uh, the UK. G4S. Unfortunately, the organizers here have had, had, had originally invited um, G4S to participate in, uh, in this debate and they kindly declined the, um, the offer to come and, and speak uh, here. Unfortunately, they do not speak in your film either. You will tell us why. And uh, so we're, we're right. It's, it's a pity that there's a, there should be an empty chair actually around the, around <laughs> the, this um, the big stage here because unfortunately uh, no one from G4S um, uh, accepted to come and uh, and debate with our with our panelist. Um, Femke, congratulations on a very very powerful film, very powerful storytelling. Uh, there there are amazing testimonies. There's Shakes, uh, who's a who's a former uh, uh, warder, a former uh, guard, and and there are so many powerful uh, testimonies of um, of uh, of prisoners and uh, and and um, and very impressive pictures also that were filmed inside uh, inside this uh, this prison. What prompted you to start this documentary? Again, you're a Dutch filmmaker. Why did you go to South Africa, and what prompted you to um, focus on this particular prison? Um, yeah, we we have known Ruth Hopkins um, from uh, for a long time. And we were following her work. Um, she Rose was the investigative journalist that has portrayed a lot in in this film. So um, she had done a lot of research and published in 2013 about um, what what went wrong and what happened in the prison. So uh, mistreatment of prisoners, um, people were assaulted, tortured, uh, injected with antipsychotic um, drugs against their will. Um, riots broke out. So Ruth had done a lot of research and publications um, that went basically um, viral. So it, 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 it was published in South Africa, but it also in the UK, by BBC, um, by a lot of major big uh, news outlets. Um, and then, the, I, like you would think that there would be accountability and and things w would improve or would happen or um, accountability for the company. g is running that prison. It's a, it's a private prison. Um, but nothing really happened. And um, the situation didn't improve. And especially for um, the warders, it uh, became even more dangerous. So we decided to make a documentary because in a documentary... Um, you can portray, like, you can go way more in depth into all the stories. Um, and this, uh, everyone um, deserves to know what happens in that prison. So that's how we sort of started together with Ruth um, this uh, journey. Your film premiered um, uh, at the end of last year, at the end of 2019, in uh, Amsterdam, the great, great festival of ITVA, International Documentary Festival in Amsterdam. Where can we see the film uh, in the upcoming months? Uh, uh, who will sh who who will show your film? Uh, different festivals, I believe, uh, television yeah, we stations. Yeah, we have. Um, it was uh, premiered in Oslo. Uh, Ilse and Ruth went there. Um, it was on a festival in Sweden. 
after Geneva, I will fly to Prague. So it will be at the One World Festival. I mean, we have a lot of festivals lined up. Um, and this will be um, basically for the coming months. The film will um, show in theaters in the Netherlands. And it will be broadcast in the Netherlands. And we have a great sales agent. So they are the ones that... It's basically the start of the film. So we hope that a lot of festivals, a lot of events um, and broadcasters will will pick it up. And we will definitely, as filmmakers, make sure that... Uh, I'm sure you will yeah. then to have a, a major impact because your film will definitely have an impact. Ruth, how did you start investigating on this particular prison? It's a seven-year investigation. You've met many, many detainees, ex-detainees, people working inside a prison, people who've worked for this prison. How far is it from Johannesburg? It's in the, it's in the, it's in the suburbs of Johannesburg? No, no, definitely not. No, it's in a, in a place called Bloemfontein, uh, which is about a four-hour drive from Johannesburg, um, in a in a in a different state called the Free State. Um, so yeah, uh, I started investigating it. So I was at the time working for the Wits Justice Project. The Wits is a university in Johannesburg. Yeah, that's the Wits University in Johannesburg, um, and the Wits Justice Project is a kind of a group of investigative journalists who focus on the criminal justice system. Um, and so our work kind of fell into two categories. On the one hand, wrongful convictions, and on the other hand, prison conditions. And so I did a, a lot of work in South African prisons. I, we basically went in and, you know, documented torture. That's kind of what it boiled down to. And inmates would also write to us. They knew who we were, and they'd write us letters. And I just noticed that this, this particular prison, Mangung Prison in Bloemfontein, there were a lot of letters, uh, a lot of inmates were writing, writing us letters, more, proportionally more than other prisons. Um, and so I actually went there to interview a guy who claimed to be wrongfully convicted. And then I thought, let me interview all these other people who've written to us while I'm there. Uh, the prison gave me access. Um, and then actually the wrongful conviction case, the guy was guilty was not wrongfully <laughs> convicted. But I then uh, started hearing all these stories that these inmates were telling me about electroshocking, and then they started talking about zombies, and these were people who were being injected with antipsychotic drugs, who were then kind of walking around like zombies. I heard about terrible assaults, I heard about people dying in the prison, I heard about very lengthy and unlawful isolation um, of inmates, and so that's that was 2012, so that's when uh, when I started. And I was lucky because, uh, you know, I'm a journalist, obviously, but the prison gave me access. So I capitalized on that. And I, in, I think over the years, I interviewed about 100 people held in that prison. Obviously, once my first article was published, uh, the doors shut. Completely, yeah. you never, you were never able to... Oh, no, they, I've, I've been told they hung up a picture uh, at the entrance of the prison, a picture of me uh, <laughs> notifying everyone never to let me in again. <laughs> Before we're going to details about what you call torture, what you call um, uh, assaults and, uh, and uh, people working like zombies, tell us a little more about GeForest. What is this company to people who have never heard yeah. about GeForest? It, it was first called the uh, uh, Group 4 and yeah. then Securitas. So it's a British and Danish Danish company. Company, yeah. Multinational, they're just about everywhere in the world. Yes. Um, I've uh, I've actually written a book um, about... Um, a book that's called The Misery, Merchants, Life and Death in a Private South African Prison, Ruth Hopkins. The uh, publisher is named... Jakana. Right? Jakana Media, yes. Um, and in the book, um, I call G4S the Invisible Giant. It's a very big company, uh, 550,000 employees, are active in 90 countries. Um, and a lot of people haven't heard of G4S, but once they learn about my work or once I talk to them, people will say, oh yeah, now I see them everywhere, you know? Um, so, so yeah, so they're, they're, they're a, a multinational private security provider. They run prisons in the UK, Australia and South Africa. They run immigration detention centers in Australia, obviously, uh, or offshore detention centers in Australia, in Austria, uh, in the UK as well. Um, and they're also active in war zones, conflict zones, and they also just provide like your regular security for, you know, buildings. Um, they have contracts with the UN, they have contracts with the EU. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so they're a very powerful, uh, large uh, company, and they're a very big employer. So they they claim to be Africa's biggest private employer, and I believe they're the third biggest private employer in the world. And again, they have declined the, uh, um, the, the to be a panelist to come and uh, and debate with uh, with uh, with you um, on the, on this on this panel. Unfortunately, um, uh, today, let's. Please, the two of you, give two or three examples. I've seen the film. There's, uh, uh, explain the problem with the toilets. There are <laughs> ceramic toilets, which yeah. seems normal. Um, but there's a financial reason for that, and there's a major problem for these ceramic uh, toilets not to be replaced by yeah. steel toilets. What is the problem? So yeah, so you're right. The and I think that's that's covered really well in the film. Uh, it, it's kind of a recurring thing that keeps coming back. Um, and it's seemingly you like you know toilets, but the 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 inmates they smash them, and then they break, and then they have these sharp shards, I guess, and they turn them into handmade weapons, and then stab each other or stab guards, and the guards at the prison they were they they were also very disgruntled and very dissatisfied with their with their working conditions and their salary, but in terms of their working uh, conditions for years they. They've been telling management, like, we're not safe here, you know, we're getting, we're getting stabbed, we're getting injured, someone's going to die, can you please replace these toilet pots? And in a lot of prisons, you'll see that there are, like, these sort of um, metal or aluminium or whatever, steel um, toilet pots that cannot be broken. Um, and to this day, G4S has not replaced them. And that's because it costs money. You know, and that's again. I think that's where you see. That's why I think it's so good that it keeps coming back in the f in the film because that's what you get when you have a for profit prison. It you know then it then it it you know what's the the priority is not the safety of the employees. Priority is to make money. cut costs. Yeah, and make money. Femke, did G Four S speak to you? Um, did you, you? You've told me that you've offered them many times to speak in your film. First, were you able to film directly in the prison, and did they speak to you? No, we didn't. We never. Um, basically, what we did uh, the four years that we were making the film, we tried to keep under the radar, um, also to be able to make the film, not to be stopped halfway. Um, and if I may cut you with this, because uh, we're faced with questions uh, many times uh, in investigative journalists that people would come to us and say, well, why did you work in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, under the radar where for so long? It's just to gather testimonies. And, uh, and uh, I've been asked this question many times uh, by spin doctors, by lawyers who would say, well, you come to us after a four-year investigation. Well, you did a four-year um, production investigation, investigating, speaking to people. Who, 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 who would have felt under a lot of pressure had the company known that you were working on this company. So once you went to them, what did they say? No, when the film, when we were um, nearly finished with the film, we, we sent them um, a right to reply. Um, and they answered. They, they, couldn't, they, um, they couldn't find themselves in, in the allegations we put forward in the film. So... Um, yeah, so we gave them the, 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 the right to reply, and they did. Um, uh, but for the rest, we didn't really get any uh, reaction directly from them. Uh, you were not able to film inside the prison. How did you gather the footage that you have seen in the, in, in the trailer, which is extremely uh, impressive? How did you gather th this footage? Who filmed it? Uh, it's the, 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 the sort of a special team, the emergency security team. It's basically a riot team that if there are problems in the prison, they will send um, to make sure that, I don't know, people are sort of um, got, uh, like riots or, or um, fights will be stopped. This team has to film by the government of South Africa. They sort of, they have to film all their actions. Obviously, they will film like what they... Uh, want to be seen basically uh, that footage was leaked so we could use like we had four hours of footage uh, when you say leaked it did not come under a freedom of information um, uh, uh, specific law it was leaked to you by uh, by by sources. leaked to the media and leaked to the media yeah it was leaked to me actually no. it was leaked <laughs> to you it was leaked to you oh, congratulations yeah. for getting for getting the uh, for getting the, the 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 access to 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 very impressive uh, very impressive pictures. Yeah, because the, the the footage really gives you 
uh, an insight of what was happening like behind these walls because it's really difficult in uh, in any prison to get access to the situation or to film inside uh, or but also to get to shoot the reality um, if we probably would have asked permission to film inside we probably would have like they probably would have shown us a completely different uh, view, like this is a proper, really uh, high-end prison. Um, but the footage actually shows like what's, what's going on. So I think that is really powerful. So we talked about the, the very Im impressive uh, uh, use of weapons and, uh, and, uh, and um, among prisoners and also prisoners attacking guards, um, this specific unit. You, um, uh, Ruth mentioned, if you could expand on this, Femke, you, Ruth mentioned torture, she mentioned also the, um, the uh, um, anti-psychotic drugs. What, stru what struck you, uh, what is going on in this prison that is totally illegal in, in your opinion, that should never happen in a prison. What, what struck you the most with all the testimonies? Because again, you have very, very powerful testimonies of uh, ex-detainees. I mean, I think what's interesting, uh, what we show in the film is, um, we did a lot of interviews with uh, prisoners that were um, uh, tortured, uh, abused, um, injected with antipsychotic drugs against their will. But slowly on, we also started to talk with the warders. And they basically also tell their side of the story, how unsafe it is and the situation, the working conditions. So slowly on in the film, we, we uncover that um, like they're basically trapped in the same system. And that's the system of uh, making money. Money is more important than the well-being of the, um, the, the, the prisoners uh, in their care, but also the employees. And I think for me that that whole process and um, like layer by layer uh, revealing that, um, I think that was the most um, uh, shocking. It's like all the elements together. So it's um, getting all the stories from the abuse, but then also the side of the, the warders. Um, they also fear for their life every day. Um, and that's all in, in the name of, of making profit. So I think that's a really strong message uh, that the film tells. Prison for profit. Later on during this panel, we'll, we'll talk about uh, a very impressive initiative that was just launched here in Geneva yesterday, part of the of the of the international festival here. The private security network will come to that later. Let me come to um, uh, Abdulaziz. Uh, how can you? and unfortunately summarize five years of being detained, not in South Africa, well, it's, uh, but in Manus six Island. Six years, <laughs> actually. You're originally, originally from Sudan, the north of, uh, of Sudan in Darfur, and you fled, trying to go to Australia, and what happened? Well, um, it's a kind of long story, but I will try and summarize it. It's uh, six years. You can write like a 10 books in six years if you want to write about the stories of what happened. But um, me fleeing a country from Sudan, I got on the boat, so which took me about roughly three and a half days to get to cross the Indian Ocean. And I arrived in a Christmas island. So first, which is the entering point of Australia, which is an island called Christmas. That's the way they welcome all the asylum seekers when they arrive. What happened was we welcomed by the Australian Federal Police and also we have a, another private security company called Serco. So this company, they operate within the mainland of Australia. So they don't have a jurisdiction to operate outside Australia. We welcome, we spend... The private company, Australian company? It's a private from? Australian company which operates inside the detention centre, on the mainland detention centre. And you could hear about them lots that there is a lot of allegations of uh, abuses and violations of human rights of the detainees and refugees who were detained there. And people get, I mean, um, people get deported by force and they use some drugs, they use some force. And for us, spending a weeks with them is that we learn something completely different, that people are different. Those people are completely different. They will be very well trained. And uh, they have like a kind of military ex-army backgrounds who serve in uh, places like Afghanistan war zones and people who have a PSD, which means once you're confronted with those peoples, it triggers their mind that... 
PTSD is, is, a, is a psychotic, uh, uh, maybe not psychotic, but it's called PTSD, post-traumatic Traumatic stress. stress disorder. Yes. It happens in war zones. It happens also in, uh, in um, when, when um, d during, um, I don't know, a terrorist attack also. It can happen on civilians, on, uh, on, um, on the military personnel. So who were suffering from PTSD? Those, uh, those, uh, those um, uh, private... Um, uh, uh, um, soldiers, uh, the, I mean the, pri the private people that were uh, holding you? Well, they are ex-soldiers, ex-police officers, ex-military. They are the ones who are suffering from it. So, once we are coming to confront with those people, they are thinking of us. Because if you say, I'm, I'm come from Afghanistan, what happened if you serve in Afghanistan? It triggers your mind that, okay, he's a hostage. Yeah, give us a, a little idea of how many nationalities were detained uh, at the same time. There were people from Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sudan? Yeah, we were from a 13 nationality, 13 nationality. Nepal, Iran, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, Syria, um, Nepal, India, Sudan, Somalia, and we have also a couple of uh, Egyptian from Egypt, and as well we have one from Algeria. So we are like 13 nationality on that place. And then you were expelled to Manus Island? So we were expelled to Manus Island by the private security company called Serco and with the help of the Australian Federal Police. So it's kind of like, I mean, tr uh, prison transfer. That they, and the way that uh, we've been treated, like on the times of the transfer, was it's completely like inhumane. It doesn't show any signs of like you are dealing with the um, vulnerable peoples. It's just kind of like you're dealing with the criminals. And from Australia to Papua New Guinea, we've been handed over to G4S. And I was shocked. I mean, we were welcomed by G4S and Papua New Guinean police in collaboration with Papua New Guinean police. So for the people, sorry to cut you, for the people joining the, this live cast, so G4S is this major international, multinational company running the prison that you investigated on in, uh, in South Africa. You arrive not in Australia, but in, uh, in uh, Manus Island, Papua New Guinea. And this prison is not run by the Australian government, by, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, not even by by by, uh, by officials from Papua New Guinea, but by a private company. How did you learn that it was for GS? Did, did they have logos on on their uniforms? Well, uh, they have a logos in their uniforms. So, which logos in their uniforms? And they have their hats as like written clearly, like a G4S. And um, just to correct you, that the prison is run by the Australian government. It's a, uh, under the MAU, Memorandum of Understanding between Papua New Guinea and the Australian government, that being signed. It allows the Australian government to send people from Australia to Papua New Guinea and keep them there. Um, and I'm sorry to say this, but under context, under two brackets, I will say like a hostage. So, and to do that there to work, you, ha you need also a dirty company who make a profit out of the human misery. And then G4S popped up. So G4S are the ones who are making profit out of the human misery. So number one with the G4S is for us. Arriving there, our numbers were 300 people. We talk about 2013, like September of 2013. By 2014, like mid-2014, the number hits up to 12,000 people. And in that 12,000 people, that's a very short period that you don't even have a time to train people. Under their agreements, they have 70%, if I'm not mistaken, 70% of the staffs for the G4S are the experts, which is Australians, New Zealanders, from all over the world. And the point is, for those people, it's the money. It's not about how to, I mean, it's not about the human rights. It's not about protecting people. It's all about money. And I, there is a, I, I would like to share these quotes with you as well, like speaking to one of the guards, and I asked him, like, why are you making money out of my own blood? And he said, look, I don't care. I'm here only for money. So whatever happened, I protect myself. And that quote, I mean, it happened in practice. In the 2nd of uh, October 2013, when there is a problem, there was a problem between the Papua New Guinean police and Navy. What happened is the G4S, left the detention centers, doors were opened, and they ran away, which means their security is first. 
And then it happened. And then when we come to 2014, that was the moment for me and the others. 1,600, I mean, 1600 people will learn something about the G4S, which they contributed into the death of our beloved brother, which is Reza Barati. And Tell us what happened. Well, it's a, it's a very long story, but I'll try to summarize the story of what happened. Because in 2013, end of 2013, December, we mobilized together, all of us as a detainees. And we, before even we start the protest, we wrote a letter to the authority because we know the Australians are responsible of us. So in that letter, we wrote a couple of sentences that we want a process. We want to know what is our future and how long are we going to stay here. And we have been completely ignored and we haven't received any feedback out of our letter. So we mobilized ourselves, we started a peaceful protest. And we were so peaceful because we know the intentions of the peoples based on the, I mean, the introductions that the authority, I mean, gave to the local peoples. We know how aggressive they are. So we're trying to play the card of being peaceful. Then that peaceful, we, it, the protest went for a couple of weeks in row. We have got a letter from the authority saying, okay, look, you have to come to the meeting. On that meeting, we were 25 leaders representing the communities inside the center. We were shocked to see 150 um, G4S guards, very well equipped and with ready to respond. And the plan was is to tell us, to send us a message that even if you start a, a riot, you are not going to win that riot. So which means we have to be afraid and stop the protest. So we told them we are not going to stop the protest until we have a clear message from the authority saying that how long we're going to stay there and when the process will start. And then on the night of the 16th, that is the, the true picture of Jufer as it comes to us, like it comes to a public face. We've been cut off from the uh, media, no one allowed in, no one allowed out. And to extend that even people, the staffs who are working there, you have to be searched upside down to make sure that you don't care any devices that can record what's happening at that night. They inform the local community about us, which we want to cause the problems to the locals. Then the locals were so upset, they start they start attacking the So when you say the locals, the local population. The local and population. And they came armed. With, what were they armed with? Machetes? Well, machetes and bush knives, and most of them also they were used throwing rocks, and the rocks were just dropping like a rain from outside. And for us, we have to cover ourselves. We run into our huts, I can call them, which is they used it from the World War II, and it's still up there. And we run inside to hide from the rocks. Then the police make like every, I mean, a lineup between the locals and the G4S and the, 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 the asylum seekers or the refugees. So what happened, the police were trying to protect us in between. But and then they make mistakes that they start shooting at us. The police are the ones who protect us, they start shooting at us. And that shooting make the G4S to run away and things got out of control. And there is the moment when we have seen the other phase of G4S, which they have a special unit they call ERT, Emergency Response Team. These people... Which we also see in your film. It's also a unit that, that arrives at the prison. So mm -hmm. it, it, what, what happened that but went so out of control that unfortunately um, one of the prisoners died? Well, in fact, we were in a place where in the middle of the night, we have no idea where we're going to go. All we see is blood. All you see in front of you is your blood. Your friends, your brothers in front of you, they are just bleeding. There is no authority that you can talk to. And the G4S that you run and you ask them for, I mean, protect us, they are the one who end up even assaulting you. And then the assault went on until like 5 a.m. 5 a.m. in the morning. And then they realize that this is, we have to end this. Then we have a Navy involved. The Navy came in and involved to support, just to push the local back the local community. The Navy managed to do that, push the local community back. We've been all removed out of the detention center. They took us to a naval, uh, I mean, like a oval, which we call like a play field. They put us there for like a couple of hours. 150 men were injured. 
And in the reports that the, the, uh, the, the government, Australian government, make it clear, like they lie a couple of times. First they say like, no, the detainees who ran out of the center and then they got beaten up. Then when the investigation came in, they discovered that no, the local community who pushed in with the support of the G4S to break, to beat the refugees and harm the refugees. And then they end up reporting about seven, 70, I mean, incidents, like 70 people were injured, but the fact is with 150, and I was one of the people who were injured. And the target was not everyone. The target wasn't that Reza. Reza was just a victim. He caught in between. The target was an, another Reza, who was a community leader, Iranian community leader, who is a fearless person, who speaks fluent English, and he started asking questions about when and how and what gives right to G4S to treat us like I mean, a cockroaches or numbers. That's how we've been described. So what gives you right to treat us like that? And then the manner of when you question people who have n zero background about human rights, someone who serve in an army who has zero background, someone who think of you like you are a hostage, what will be the reaction of that person? First, he will take a personal problem with you, which means no matter where I see you, I will assault you and I will cover myself up. And this is what they do. They assault us, and once you write a complaint, your complaint, it just disappears. And you never know who and why your complaint is disappear. Very impressive testimony. There's one key thing is pictures. Uh, you could comment um, this panel. Please uh, write uh, comments on the, on the on whichever um, social network um, you're watching us, on the website, on YouTube, on Facebook. You can ask questions. We will take questions from uh, wherever you are in the world. Please write to us and ask questions to our panelists. Pictures. Um, the, 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 the outrage um, became worldwide when um, people started to learn about the situation of you and your fellow detainees. How were pictures smuggled out? How did you, um, yourself, you told me, uh, were able to leak some pictures on um, Al Jazeera um, television? How was that possible? Well, it was a difficult. It's a risky that myself and, couple, and a handful of other people who we took, because we stood in front and we um, trying to report what is happening, because we found ourselves we are in the middle of nowhere. I mean, to extend that, I mean, phone is a contraband item. Pen is a contraband item. You can't even use a pen to write something. It's a contraband item. So the point, what we did is we thought of, if you are in a prison, what first thing comes to your mind? It's because you have a time. And if you don't use your time in a good way, the time will use you. And if the time use you, you will end up taking your own life. And if you use the time, maybe you will be the voice of the people who are inside there. So I don't smoke, and we get our allowance every week, which is three packet of cigarettes, which um, allows me to start collecting cigarettes. I start collecting cigarettes from uh, random people because I help them a lot. So in a f returning a favor, people are offering me a cigarette, but I did not tell them about my plan. And then I use that 100 packet of cigarettes to trade with one of the locals. He is one of the ERT team guys, which is emergency response team. They walked in, they walked out. I tried he was a G4S uh, It's a G4S stuff. You, you had how many packs of cigarettes? 100 packets of cigarettes. 100. Yes, 100 packets of cigarettes in exchange with a small phone. And the reason why I want to have that phone is I want to send some pictures out of that place. Telling you a story of that place is, I mean, in the 12, last 12 years that the Australian government running this place, they have no access, zero access to the media. Journalists were banned. And as... I mean, she mentioned something about how pictures been, I mean, put in front of the prison. I mean, it's happened to one of the journalists, Ben Doherty, is a Guardian journalist, who was, his picture has been put in front of the center. So for us, we have to collaborate with the journalists. I got that phone, but the rumors went into the, in the center, not to the detainees, but went to the G4S staff that we suspect that someone has a phone. So what happened is, Every three weeks we have a search, and the search will conduct by G4S and the police. They toss your, your stuff from the rooms inside out. And even if you hide anything inside that room, they will find it. But luckily, what I did is another risk I took. I removed the electric, electricity plug, 
which is I untied it, I put my phone inside, and then I tied it back. And no one in the planet would think that someone hides something inside there, and they wouldn't even think of touching it because it's electricity. And that's what helped me to keep my phone, and it's also helped me to send pictures outside. But sending pictures outside was very difficult. I mean, it's a big challenge. Another risk I took, I started searching randomly for any organization that can help. Whoever on the planet, you were wherever you are, if you are there to help, I was looking for you. And first name popped into my screen was the, the name of, uh, I mean, Sydney, I mean, ref refugee coalitions based in Sydney. So an, an, an NGO. An NGO. So it's an NGO. I mean, it's run by a very, very nice person. His name is Ian Rental, and um, I mean, have a respect to this man. I mean. First day, and you sent him some videos or first, some still first pictures? Well, I mean, first I got his contact. Before even I sent the picture, I just sent him my names and I said I'm inside the detention center. And he replied straight away and he said, like, no way, you can, that's impossible. So what next I have? I took my ID, so we have an ID which it has a number on it because we're known to the authority as a number. And what G4S use it all the time, Q and K, BRF, FRH. So I took a picture of my ID card, I sent it to him, and I said, now I can confirm that it's me or not. And he said to me, like, you are crazy. What if I am one of the authorities? What if I report you to the immigration minister? Do you know what will happen to you? You will get deported. And I say to him, short sentence, that I have nothing to lose because I'm inside the prison at the end of the day. So he was the first person, and he helped me to get those pictures out. And... Those pictures end up in a CNN, Al Jazeera, and they all come to learn about the Australian secret prisons in officials, and also come to learn about the, the GFRS who are making profit out of the human misery in those places. And in very brief words, how long did it take for you to be released and uh, for the scandal to be exposed? It took so long. It took so long to extend that uh, we were so upset. We were so upset even about the, uh, about the international community, ignorancy. And uh, we realized that because we were detained by one of the Western liberal democratic countries, such as Australia, and there is no one going to criticize Australia based on what they are doing it. But then, it, uh, for me and my friends, it took us six years to come to learn, to just expose that government. And also to put things on the table for the international community to witness that this is happening. And we are not talking about 19th century. We are not talking about 15th century. But it's in the 21st century. And it's not in the Middle East. It's not in Africa. But it's, it is in one of the liberal democratic country. So what will be the, um, the reaction of the international community? And then we come to learn that the international community starts sending letters and start naming and shaming Australia about their treatments. But, and so sad to see even Europe today are copying Australian, I mean, human rights abuse. We will come to that a bit later because um, you were, when was that, last week, the week before, in Lesbos, in Greece. And, um, and it appears that you've seen G4S people there also. So, uh, sorry to tease <laughs> a little bit. I would like, we'll come back to you okay. and we'll talk about Lesbos. And also about the compensation um, uh, and the controversy um, in, in Australia. Uh, let me, go, thank you so much, uh, Abdelaziz Mouabat, for, for a very powerful testimony. Agnès Calamar, um, you're French, you're the special rapporteur, rapporteur spécial uh, on the extrajudicial um, summary, arbitrary um, executions. But um, in, in, with all your uh, experience and the international law, how do you react to what you've heard going on in South Africa and uh, in, um, in uh, uh, Abdulaziz Muhammad uh, case? Uh, first of all, these were extremely uh, powerful uh, testimonies, and I'm uh, so honored to be uh, to be here in uh, in your company. I haven't heard you yet, but I'm sure it's uh, as powerful. Uh, look, I think there are many rich themes that are being discussed he here, and uh, the privatization of security is only 
one tiny aspect of particularly uh, uh, the, the last testimony, which is about the, uh, the migration deterrence policy adopted by a number of, of governments, uh, starting with Australia and now, uh, as you were pointing out, uh, very much uh, present in, in Europe. But I'm going to put that aside because I think we were here to talk first and foremost about uh, the privatization um, of security. So the first thing I want to, to say is that the prison conditions that have been uh, described uh, are not, uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the prerogative of private prisons and that uh, around the world, uh, torture, uh, abysmal prison conditions, uh, impunity, uh, all of those things are part and parcel, unfortunately, of the prison regime uh, in, in many countries. So I think what we need to reflect upon is what is the privatization of detention adding on to what we know are already difficult uh, conditions uh, and difficult human rights situation. First of all, to me, the privatization of detention raises very deep philosophical problem uh, and issues regarding um, the, uh, the, the, the commoditization, the profit making that is being placed as you were actually talking about misery. As societies, should we see uh, that misery as a market from which profit can be derived. Very strong words. Detainees becoming a, a commodity. That's exactly what, that's why I'm saying that's one of the more, the, for me, uh, this is the most important issue we need to grapple with because the, the conditions are there in many prisons. The privatization of prison raises that deep philosophical question of our societies moving into a market prism, imposing a market prism on misery, imposing a market prism, I will say not on security. Those, those companies are not in the business of security, they are in the business of insecurity because they are taking profit out of insecurity. If there was security, they will not make a profit. They need more people in the prison, they need them to stay longer, and they need them to return. That's the opposite of security. So to pretend that those companies are in the business of security is a lie. They are in the business of creating insecurity for the purpose of profit. And I think that also raises uh, a second problem Dep uh, different from the fact of the commoditization of the detainee and of imprisonment. Around the world, what the privatization of prison have added to the already very difficult human rights conditions are a couple of uh, additional points. The first one is that uh, studies have shown that prisoners that are detained in private prison are far more likely to come back to prison uh, and that the, the, the policy of reinsertion is far weaker within private prison than they are in uh, public prison. Uh, studies have also shown that the violence, prisoners on prisoners, uh, prisoners against guard, guards against prisoners is much higher. Uh, and that has been actually done by, uh, by officials themselves in the United States, for instance. So that violence is much higher in private prison than they are in uh, public uh, prison. Studies have shown that prisoners are in far worse health situation uh, in private prison than they are in public prison. So the public data collected even by government agencies themselves, will tend to show that the human rights violations are more likely to be higher in a private prison than they are in a public prison. Additional points, additional problems are those of transparency and those of accountability uh, in a public uh, prison publicly run prison transparency may not be the modus operandi, but those prisons are paid for by tax money. They respond to a number of regulations that do not apply to private prison. Accountability is far more difficult 
to, um, to get at when you are dealing with the private corporations. There is far more complexities into lines of responsibilities. There is far more complexity into holding individuals to account beyond the, the, the private guard, the, the uh, individual guards. So all of those um, findings combined to demonstrate that uh, private uh, detention facilities are not only an, uh, a major ethical issue, they are not only a major philosophical problem around the commoditization of people, they practically are increasing the likelihood of human rights violations and they are increasing the likelihood of immunity for those violations. You're extremely, extremely clear. For the people joining us, we're talking about the privatization of um, detention centers. As a special rapporteur, um, uh, within the United Nations, how, uh, what is your what is your 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 link directly to the, to the United yeah. Nations? Because my question will be, you're extremely clear. Mm. This is. There's a, there, there are rules, there are laws, and it's a very strange business. Very, very strange business to give this to private uh, people and uh, to private companies, uh, for-profit uh, companies, and we're talking about major human rights vi vi violations. How can you address this issue with the world leaders, with the government of um, uh, Australia, with the government of uh, South Africa? So um, there are a couple of uh, of initiatives already within uh, I'm at, sorry, at the if you international... Can, if we can understand a little more about your role okay, uh, so in, I am, in the organization. I am a UN, uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur. We are independent experts appointed by member states uh, to uh, investigate, monitor, report, uh, and uh, send alarms or alert. The question of the security, securitization of security, <laughs> the privatization of security has been a, a priority actually for the international community. For instance, uh, in 2012, I think, uh, don't uh, quote me on that, but in the 2000s, uh, the international community appointed a working group on the question of mercenaries. Uh, in response to the growing use of private in the private firms for the purpose conflicts of war making. Conflicts in Africa, in conflicts exactly. in Afghanistan, so, Iraq, of uh, course. Yeah, so that's, that's one initiative. Uh, almost all of us, special rapporteurs, we have fif some 50 of us, have at some point or another tackled the fact of the privatization of human rights protection, or in this case, human rights lack of protection. Um, in my context, uh, my, uh, my colleagues that preceded me in that position has actually written a report on private security firms uh, and the, um, the problem that we are confronting as an international community for their regulation. There are a number of initiatives, there are a number of self-regulatory initiatives that can be, that are important and we certainly welcome them, but I think Everything we have heard so far will demonstrate that they are far from being sufficient. Uh, they are, there should be mechanisms at national level, but those mechanisms are insufficient. Um, it's already difficult for a proper oversight over prison in general, including public prison. When those prisons become private prison, the public oversight becomes more important, but it's on, at some level is more hampered. Uh, there are initiatives uh, at global level uh, focusing on the human rights responsibilities of corporate actors. There is a specific focus on the human rights uh, and other forms of responsibilities of private security providers. Um, I think the reality is at the moment those uh, initiatives are well taken. They are not sufficient. Uh, they are not protecting individuals on the ground, as we have uh, just heard, because this is a very recent phenomena, as is the prison that have been uh, described here. So we need something far more radical um, with regard to, um, to the role of those private security firms. And again, I think whatever response we're going to take, the first question we must ask is whether or not we ought to commodify, to impose a profit on the misery 
on imprisonment and on insecurity. And I have no doubt that your answer is definitely... N my, my answer will be, m in general, absolutely not. Uh, there will be certain circumstances where um, the, uh, the, 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 the governments may be unable may not have the capacities, may not have the skills, may not have the uh, necessary people uh, to do certain very specific security-related activities. But when this is the case, those need to be circumscribed in time, circumscribed in space, and must be under very clear uh, and uh, important uh, public scrutiny. And you are, have made this extremely clear on this panel. May you be heard, and uh, and it's important that you're here based at the United Nations. Before we take pictures, not pictures, before we take questions from uh, the people who have been watching this, uh, this live cast, uh, Michael Flynn, please tell us about your expertise. You're the director of the Global Detention Project. You're based here in Geneva. And uh, one word about uh, your home country, the US. Uh, you have a rough idea of how many prisons in the US are privatized? It's a, it's a huge business. I couldn't tell you. Um I can tell you that there are 900 prisons under contract in the United States to hold immigrants and asylum seekers, which is an impressive number if you think about it. Um, and that gives you a clue a little bit about what I do uh, at the Global Detention Project, which is we look very narrowly on the issue of immigration detention in contrast to the issue of criminal incarceration. And there's a very important distinction to, to be made here, especially when we talk about things like commodification, which is that with immigration detention, there's an elimination of somebody from the social sphere. With criminal prison, the philosophy is supposed to be this person is going to be rehabilitated to re-enter society. Immigration detention is not for helping people re-enter society. They're to disappear them like Aziz. And so that distinction is a very important thing to take into account when we consider the issue of privatization. So I'll come to privatization in a minute, but for me, what I think joins this issue of criminal incarceration and administrative immigration detention together is this issue of accountability. Privatization allows not only the companies themselves, but the states to to, uh, to escape accountability for the treatment of people. And I think that when I look at the issue of immigration detention, which is a kind of detention where Aziz found himself in, what's happening in privatization is part of a larger phenomenon, which is that wealthy countries want to stop being accountable for the treatment of immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees, and they want to push out those controls. The term we use is externalization. Um, privatization is a part of that. It's a part of saying, we're going to give responsibility for the treatment of these people to other countries, poorer countries. We're gonna give them to private actors. Um, and we're trained going- Trained people or not really trained people? And many, I mean, look, I mean, what's happening in Libya? Do you think that placing people in the custody of Libyan Coast Guard, which the European Union supports... And is, finances. And finances. Is that placing people in the hands of someone who's being trained to treat them properly? So I, I think that what is happening today, uh, specifically with the issue of immigration detention, asylum detention, the prevention of refugees from coming across borders, is this. Privatization is part of a bigger puzzle that we're faced with, not even a puzzle, humanitarian disaster, which is these states that have the means to help these people don't want to. And Where so are, go, go ahead. Go on. Where are the, the main focus of your organization at this time? What, what, the, all the situations are terrible. What, what, what are the, the worst? I understand you're tracking, mapping uh, the, 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 the pr private detention systems. Where are the major problems? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> but I would say that one of the key focal points right now is um, the, what you may, what, uh, I think migration scholars call transit states. Um, states that are between the countries where there are problems, where people are leaving, and their destinations. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Mexico. We're talking about Libya. We're talking about Turkey, which is big in the news today, as we all know. Uh, we, uh, the wealthy countries of the world, we're talking about Papua New Guinea. We're talking about Indonesia. Uh, the wealthy countries of the world would like those countries to be the, the detainers of these unwanted people. 
and, uh, uh, and, and the, the, the phenomenon of G4S becoming more deeply involved in countries like this is something that's very disconcerting um, because it's another layer of complication for trying to hold to account somebody for the mistreatment of these people in these facilities. How do you operate when you say tracking? Do you, you, you have um, contacts? Uh, how, how do you operate? You're an NGO, you're a non-profit organization. Yeah. How, how do you operate? Well, we, have a, we, we operate by working very closely with people on the ground who are visiting detention centers or have recently left detention centers and have been debriefed by, by, by people in the field. We're here in Geneva. It's a main task also of the um, ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. They, 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 they also visit and have this mandate to, uh, to, to, um, to visit uh, detention centers. H how complicated is it to access? For example, have you met uh, G4S officials, I, no, uh, no, no. Uh, spokespeople? But I have, in the U.S., I've met with the private prison contractors, the main ones, like corp uh, the, the CCA is CCA, one of the yes. most important ones. Um, and, it, and I tell you, they can be very savvy. It's not, I think in many cases they will avoid these kinds of uh, situations, but in others they can be quite savvy and enter a conversation because they see it's to their benefit to do so, and they try to present a, 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 a pleasant face on what they do. As we saw in the film, they, when they open this facility, they, they, they try to present something as, wow, we're going to give people means and skills, which, wow, it's amazing what you guys uncovered in terms right, of... What we see in the documentary that we're talking about, the prison for profit, that uh, very, very quickly, if I'm clear, or Ruth j just said that, yes, they, they were supposed to train uh, and to have an amazing program of, I don't know, schools, education, and unfortunately, unfortunately, how, 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 what was the result? So Mangon uh, opened its doors. It was very That's much... The, the, the prison uh, it's called operated Mangon. by um, yeah. G4S in South Africa. When it opened its doors, it was very much advertised as a, as a prison with a lot of ed educational programs and opportunities. Um, and it actually attracted uh, inmates. People would... Uh, I, I know of a few people... But actually, I would like to be in this prison yeah, rather they than in a state a, prison. A, a transfer, yeah, because there was more educational opportunities. Uh, but I think in reality, um, what, what I found in my investigation is that uh, uh, examples of the company giving um, uh, the prisoners a certificate for their, let's say, computer course, but not giving them the course. <laughs> so they could collect from the state the money for the course, but um, not waste, waste any money on the actual course. <laughs> Michael, yeah. you've, you've witnessed well, that also yeah, with the organization? Yeah, uh, in fact, though, uh, it's sometimes the issue of the privatization of prisons or detention centers is not as clear-cut as we've seen in the two cases that we've heard today. And I can tell you the facility, one facility, for instance, that I visited in the United States, it's called the T. Don Hutto Women's Center, which is a nice name for detention center. It was formerly called the Family Center because it was one of the few detention centers in the United States that detained children. Um, and now it's just Children women. detained by a private company. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they okay. CCA under did under they did a, a lot of work on that facility, especially when um, with the Obama administration coming in and uh, and I was invited actually to visit this facility and I had so many different handlers. They were doctors, the medical staff. I mean, I was walking around this facility and it was amazing. Um, and the women I interviewed, some of them would be like from Honduras and, and one woman had been deported four times. Her, her child was born down the street in Houston. Um, so the child was American citizen, but she kept getting detained and deported and she kept coming back. And every time she came back, she would eventually be detained and placed in different detention centers, some of which in the United States happen to be criminal prisons. So the criminal prison system in the United States is deeply involved in the issue of detention of migrants. It's not just specialized facilities. So you met her? This was so organized I'm, by this public relations No, tour, this was actually organized after the fact through an NGO in Austin, Texas, which is close to this facility, which helped me arrange for interviews for me after this so I could do some kind of uh, have some perspective of detainees. The company did not let us talk to or did not invite us to talk to detainees. Um, in any case, this, this one woman who had been detained in many different places, um, and this was her second time in, in, in Hutto, she, she asked me, point, she said, is there some way you can help guarantee that 
I'm going to be deported next week. I'm going to come back again. Is there something, advice you can get me to get me detained, uh, detained here again? <laughs> if I get really? in Tidan Hato? Because the services were so exceptionally good. Now, what's important to keep in mind is this is what the company did intentionally. They're making Tidan Hato a advertisement. So it's not as if you can say Tidan Hato is like private prisons in the rest of America it would, or anywhere else in the world. You couldn't, but they certainly used it. They're clever. They're savvy. They do these kinds of things with intention. And so it's very important to know that when you get into these situations. Uh, if, if I may add something. Um, you were talking about the UK children, maybe? No, I, I was just going to say that um, One quick the, public, about the, UK, the public... There are some children? The, public, um, the, the privatization of prison is not a fatality. It's a public policy decision, because if we look at the United States, uh, the, at the end of the Obama administration, a decision was made mm. that these were not uh, yeah. the direction that the United States should go into for all the reasons that I have highlighted. Uh, and uh, at the end of the Obama administration, the decision was made to shut down or to decrease the number of private prisons. It's federal only prisons. yeah, it's only at the federal level. Yeah, federal yeah, at federal level, at local level, it's uh, they have their own. But it's only under when Trump got elected uh, at federal level, the public policy became one once again one of yeah. reprivatization. Yeah. So it is it is a question of choice. It's a political choice. It's possibly an ideological choice. Uh, it's not a fatality. That's the point I wanted to make. And regarding the uh, the privatization of prison in the UK, I am not uh, I'm not an expert on that particular case, but you may know more about it. But there juvenile was, centers. Apparently. There was there was a, t a center for children that was um, uh, under the uh, you know the management of a of a private uh, firm and. Um, uh, footage um, that were leaked out of the of that prison for children demonstrated the mistreatment of children and resulted into a very uh, big po po policy change uh, on uh, on that particular issue. It was actually G4S. Yeah, was that G4S. was G4S. And they Bernard then Ringo. they then decided they also they had they ran juvenile detention centres in the states as well ran into all these troubles mm -hmm. there and then they withdrew from this sector. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing they they, they kind of you know, bad publicity and scandals, you know, they just withdraw and then move into another But not in this case, sector. not in your case, not in the case in South Africa. They have No, they are. They've announced that they're, well, they're when this prison contract is up, they're, they're, they're withdrawing from prisons in, uh, in South Africa. And I mean, in, in child detention, uh, G4S in the UK has just a terrible um, reputation because... Yeah, terrible. Uh, and in, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's baffling. In 2004... Um, they ran a juvenile detention center and they were using this illegal chokehold and they basically choked a child, a 15-year-old boy, to death. And the man who was responsible for this was later promoted to manager of child, whatever, child care or whatever they called it. Um, so there's, there's very little accountability within this company as well, you know, and with the state. Because, I mean, it, it took a whole nother scandal and more children who were being abused for the government to actually say, OK, this is not OK, we should do something about it. One dead child wasn't enough, you know? Mm. I think if I may add something in regarding to the child, I mean, the children detentions, we also had the similar issue um, in Nauru. Nauru is another island where Australia... Small has island a between a small um, uh, New yeah. Zealand and... Uh, and Australia. Yeah, so it's in a small island where it's Australia also has the, uh, an offshore detention there. And that one, it's uh, mixed detention. It's not only for like a single male, it's not like a man. So Nauru, we um, had like 120 children there back in the days. And they, when G4S was running that detention center, there were a lot of allegations of, uh, I mean, sexual, uh, I mean, allegations of the children. And also there is a mistreatment of children which lead to a uh, um, like a suicide attempt. Children under age of like 10 years old, they learn about how to take their own life. Mm -hmm. And that things, when it comes up, exposed by some of the staff member, also it's uh, forced the company to withdraw, but they did not withdraw. So the company name withdraw, but replaced with another private company, but same stuff, which is the same stuff with the you know, similar experience of treating peoples and torturing peoples, they are there still on the ground. So it's this, the, ch the children things, it is happening. 
It's happening everywhere. Even in the places like where we are as well, children are there, manors are there. You want yeah. to expand on that? No, 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 no. no this is uh, Abdulaziz, can you tell us about Lesbos? Um, you went to Greece a couple of weeks ago. Um, who, on, on, on what occasion, uh, what, orga uh, uh, what organization uh, um, uh, organized uh, your, your visit to, to Greece? Um, how, how did that happen and what did you witness? Well, um, to be honest, my visit to Greece, I was uh, personally funded my trip and I wasn't backed up by any organizations, but luckily I reached out to a few of my contacts just to um, ask if I could uh, meet people there. And if you ask me one of the reasons why do, you, why do I wanted to go to Greece, I mean, it's because, I mean, I'm deeply involved in the issue of the, uh, I mean, um, the right of the refugees and migrants. And we, I've been engaging fully in the, I mean, try to see what happened in Australia side, but as I live in Europe as well today, I mean, also it's opened another door for me to understand how Europe are treating the refugees and migrants when people come to them. And interestingly, you, get, you don't get to know, to hear much about Europe, neither from UN charter bases, neither from the media as well about the Greece, because it's in Europe and there is also a geographical, um, I mean, locations of Greece and which also give Greece another um, space of keeping it under the radar. So I went there only to know that, also to compare my experience, being detained in prison for six years, and now want to know, like, how, what's the difference between that prison, which run by the, I mean, private uh, contractors, like G4S, Wilson Security, and, and this one here in Europe. And I was shocked. I mean, to tell you this, I was shocked. And I never, um, I never experienced something like this in my life. G4S is not operating this prison. Nevertheless, you saw some of their, of their officers. What were they doing on the island? Well, I mean, this is the interesting question. I mean, what did they doing? What are they doing on the, on the islands? Because G4S are not. Uh, I was not expected to see G4S on the island. I went. I saw the horrible situation of people. Like 19,000 people, as we speak today, they are sleeping. They have no shelter. No enough foods, no electricity, no medical treatments. Children's women are wearing a diapers to sleep at night because there's no toilets. And as I was investigating individually, I took the risk to stay in the center, although the, the alerts come through that the center is not safe after eight. I stayed there until like nine and 10 to just let the police leave. And after the police, so I can get access to walk inside the center. And luckily, the police left at 8 o'clock, and then at 9, I went inside the center, and I was shocked to see G4S were there. What but, were they doing? But it's interestingly that they are not there to protect the humans who are there, because under their conspiracy that they don't see them as a human beings who deserve protections, they just look at them as like in numbers that we can sweep them away, or you can just erase them. But they are there to protect the... Uh, the, the European Center for Asylum, which I don't, their names, uh, I can't remember their names, but they're there to protect their staff. Interestingly, they are not there they're to protect. They're security officers. It's like a security officers, G4S. And it's brought, I mean, the memory that I had of G4S on Manus Island and then seeing them in Greece. And the only things that I say to myself is there's nothing good will come out of these people if as long as they are involving in this, I mean, atrocity that happening in Greece. So which means they're everywhere they go, they put their hands, they're ruining things. And we have so to there's all, if I can just add to that, there's already been a, a court case uh, against G4S because uh, they provide uh, security for the European, I think it's called the Asylum, Euro -Leaf. Euro -Leaf. Uh, Asylum Support Office, I yeah. think it's called. And yeah, so they provided security and they were basically making it impossible for refugees and their lawyers to access that building. And so there's already been uh, a court case against them. Ruth, tell us uh, uh, about the report. You were talking about accountability. Uh, tell us about the report. There was a there was a secret report in South Africa on on the prison you investigated. So again, the, uh, Ruth Hopkins, you're an investigative uh, journalist. You live in South Africa and in Europe, and you you investigated this G four S prison. There was. Um, public um, um, uh, inquiry, it was uh, run by uh, the parliament or by uh, the uh, specific ministry? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, <laughs> sort of around the, the, the time that my first expose was published, um, 
the guards at the prison also went on strike uh, and the situation at the pr prison spun out of control completely to such an extent that the state had to step in and take over the Department of Correctional Services, actually. And the Minister um, of Correctional Services at the time when my expose was published said, this is unacceptable, we're going to investigate this, we're going to leave no stone unturned. Um, and we will issue a report in 30 days. Um, so I was quite happy about that, you know, that you know my work was seemingly having an impact. Um, and then nothing happened. The minister was sent to Australia as a high commissioner and then kind of disappeared. The then National Commissioner of Correctional Services um, was also moved to another post and the report just never materialized. Lawyers at Wits University then took this to court and under freedom of information laws, they demanded access to this report and, um, and they uh, directed this demand to the Department of Correctional Services because they're supposed to release this report. G4S, who previously had said, we're not subject to freedom of information laws, we're a private body, they suddenly asked the judge, can we be added to this case? And the first thing they did was um, ask for the evidence underlying this report not to be discussed in open court. They wanted an in-camera hearing. Thankfully, that was denied. And about three weeks ago, the judge ordered the release of an unredacted report but the Department of Correctional Services has been sitting on this report for six years. Um, so that's a question in my mind, like why did they, why did they not release this report? And in summary, um, the, the, the report is... Um, is it, it completely confirms my work. So it details um, assaults, uh, it details falsification of uh, medical records, it details uh, uh, the, the f uh, forced medication with antipsychotic drugs, uh, that, that uh, inmates were, were given uh, really heavy duty antipsychotic drugs without a prescription of a doctor, that inmates were being overdosed, they were being given expired medication. Um, or social control for, for, for in, 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 in the prison. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it did, the report didn't mention social control. It was a very factual report, uh, but it, it, it detailed it detailed that, uh, and as well the elements of corruption that I touched on with these uh, these uh, certificates, uh, specifically with regards to the food. So again, you know, this is again where I think you know the the, the for profit prisons are problematic, exactly. because they the G4S would get like a, a, an amount of money from the Department of Correctional Services for let's say. 500 grams of meat, mm. two vegetables, uh, and three eggs. Mm. Um, and, what, and what this report detailed is that what they were actually giving the prisoners was no meat, meat mm. one vegetable, and let's mm. say one egg. That's what was found in the US as well, yeah. with the private, privately run prison that they were taking money away from the food. That's yeah. why the health, uh, the, the weight of prisoners was lower Dropping, in yeah. private mm. prison than it was in public prison. Oh, that's interesting, Accountability, yeah. we were saying, yes, there should be much more uh, public scrutiny on these and prisons. And if, if I can just add one thing about that accountability, what I think is also um, a very problematic, and maybe that's specific to the South African situation, but the actual prison contract uh, belongs to G4S and four other shareholders, and their local companies, their South African businesses, um, and they have very strong links to government. Mm. Uh, so they're like former politicians run them. And I think that in terms of it, th that's really problematic in terms of accountability because these businesses do not want to lose their very impressive stream of income because it's an extremely profitable uh, contract. Um, and so th in my mind, that is actually the answer to the question like, why was this report not released for six years? That's why, you know, because kind of business and, and, and government, they're sort of bedfellows, you know what I mean? Like the, yeah. Uh, if I can just jump go as ahead. well on Our that time issue is almost on up, of accountability. But, uh, very briefly, okay. go ahead. Um, the, the issue of accountability uh, raises two intermingled questions, in my view. A, how do we hold the state to account in situations where the prisons are privately run? And B, how do we hold the corporation? 
into account. Under international law, or indeed under domestic law, you can probably hold an individual criminally liable, but to hold the corporation mm. criminally liable is not <coughs> that easy. And most, and a number of legal framework, in fact, around the world will not allow mm. uh, corporations to be held criminally liable for what they've done in the prison. There are some legal notions such as vicarious liability applied to corporate, uh, to corporation that could work, but they have not been tested yet. So the corporations are not held criminally liable for all the violations that have been detailed here. Major problem. Second problem is how do you hold the state liable? In theory, the state is completely responsible for for the violations committed by the corporation it has delegated its authority to. In practice, um, that does not happen very clearly, very easily. In any situations where the delegations take many shapes and where there is an increased distance between the violations and the state complicates greatly both the investigation and the assignment of responsibilities both individually and collectively. So for all those reasons, uh, uh, the search for accountability is uh, not very straightforward, and uh, that's why, uh, from a human rights law standpoint, the privatization of prison is an added problem to the overall problems linked to detention and places of detention more generally. Thank you so much, Agnès Canamar, uh, again, uh, rapporteur special, uh, rapporteur special en français, uh, special rapporteur at the, at, the, at the United Nations. Our time is up, unfortunately. Um, uh, one word, Ruth, about the, uh, the, um, the uh, initiative that was launched oh, yeah. here um, in just two, three uh, sentences. It's called the Private Security Network. I mean, the investigation has to continue. Congratulations for your work um, you. in, uh, in, in South Africa. And now you're teaming up with a team of how many investigative journalists uh, you've launched this yesterday here? Uh, we're a network of 33 investigative journalists in 20 different countries. And we're all um, we're investigating the private security industry because uh, I think, as Mrs. Calamari was saying, you know, there's not a lot of, th it's very unregulated and there's not a lot of like democratic checks and balances. It's a bit of a black hole, really. And so we're investigating, we've set this up so that journalists will investigate uh, the private security industry as a whole. And we've started with G4S because it's the biggest private security company and obviously because, you know, um, we've produced a book and a film about this company. And so currently um, what we've launched is the, the private security network and our first, let's say, project or first transnational investigation is into G4S. So you can find us on privatesecurity.network um, and for a, for a period of another year, we will be um, hosting content and investigations into uh, and into people this can multi to directly uh, confidentially. I mean, you can gather testimonies. Yes, we, sorry, I've yeah, seen that's this in a website. good point. We also have a, a leak platform where whistleblowers can safely, securely, and anonymously um, leak information about the private security industry. It's okay, a major, good. major, major human rights issue. Thank yeah. you so much for participating in this panel. Congratulations to the organizers to, to have invited you. have learned a lot, and I believe our viewers have learned a lot. Uh, it's unfortunately, uh, it's unfortunate because of, of the virus that unfortunately we could have not um, had questions from the room. And then again, that there's an empty seat. There was no one from this uh, private security company, G4, or any of the other uh, uh, private companies. Your film uh, is called um, uh, Prison for Profit. I'm sorry. Please look it out in uh, in uh, festivals um, close to um, close to where you uh, close to where you live. Um, very important issue that you're raising at the United Nations. I hope that the the key leaders can. Uh, I mean, there of there course, but the, 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 yeah. there are some very strong initiatives. But as we have seen in the, in, in the U.S., there are major uh, setbacks. Um, Aziz Mohammed, thank you so much for for, for participating. It was great also to get your your views on what's going on in. Uh, in, in Greece. And Michael Flynn, yes, there's a lot of work in your NGO. I hmm. mean, uh, um, you were mentioning Turkey, uh, and, uh, and there are so many refugees, um, uh, unfortunately, in very, very difficult situations. It's
a great honor for me to have uh, had the, 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 the time to, to speak with you. Uh, please comment and please follow on the, all the other uh, debates that it will be live cast at the uh, festival, the FIFDH, the international, I have it in French in my head, so it's an international film festival and forum on human rights is live and going on and streaming. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.